This is Janelle Yates, Senior Editor of OBG Management. Dr. Ann Calhoun sometimes jokes that she's a neurogynecologist or a gyneconeurologist, a reference to her expertise in managing both the neurologic and hormonal aspects of menstrual migraine. In reality, she's a headache specialist, a partner and co-founder of the Carolina Headache Institute in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and a professor in the departments of psychiatry and anesthesiology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. In this in-depth two-part interview, Dr. Calhoun explains how oral contraceptives can actually help women with migraine. In part one, she defines migraine with and without aura and dissects the data on oral contraceptives and stroke and oral contraceptives and migraine. In the process, she explains why, in the setting of migraine, she thinks ACOG's last practice bulletin on the use of hormonal contraception in women with coexisting medical conditions needs to be updated to reflect the low-dose oral contraceptive formulations widely used today. In part two of the interview, she explains the benefits of oral contraceptives for some women with migraine, explains how she chooses an oral contraceptive formulation and regimen, and tells why she thinks OBGYNs are in a unique position to help women with headaches. Dr. Calhoun, how did you come to be a headache specialist? Well, that goes back uh, many years ago when I uh, saw a patient whose chief complaint was headache. And then she said her duration of symptoms was 11 years. And, of course, she was scheduled for a 10-minute appointment. She was about 27 years old and was on about 22 different medications. I I didn't even know where to start. So I said, just stop all these medicines. Come on back. Let's make an appointment for an hour, and let's get to the bottom of this. She came back about a month later and was glowing. Uh, She said, you know, you're a genius. My headaches are gone. I had no idea what I'd done. I mean, all I had done was tell her to stop the things she was taking, none of which were essential. Um, I mean, many of the medications were prescribed to fight the side effects of the others. But what I had unconsciously done was cure her medication overuse headache, which wasn't even commonly appreciated back in the 1970s. We now know that the overwhelming majority of patients who present to headache clinics have medication overuse headache just due to their overusing acute therapies. I guess before we go further, maybe we should establish some definitions. What, how would you define migraine, menstrual migraine, and migraine with aura? Yes, a very important issue, uh, particularly since most patients with migraine don't even know that they have migraine. I mean, obviously, they must know that they're having headaches, but they typically call their headaches whatever their parents call theirs, sinus headache, stress headache, sick headache, menstrual headache. By our formal ICHD-2 criteria, and that's International Classification of Headache Disorders, second edition, migraine has to meet two out of four criteria. It can be one-sided, throbbing, made worse with activity, or at least a four on a scale of one to ten, you know, moderate to severe levels. You only have to have two. Now, additionally, migraine must have at least one of two associated symptoms, either nausea with attacks or the simple preference to avoid bright lights and loud noises when you have one. The patients often mistakenly think that migraine means incredibly severe headache. It doesn't. Migraine can be mild and still technically meet these criteria. Migraines are headaches that have a propensity to turn ugly. But if you see a headache that kind of puts the patient out of the game, you know, they're missing work, they're having to lie down with it, you're probably looking at migraine. The other disabling primary headache, and here primary means that it's not secondary to some underlying condition. Uh, The other primary disabling headache is is cluster. And in women, migraine is roughly a thousand times more common than cluster, which is rare to begin with, and it's mostly in men. Now, menstrual migraine has established research criteria. Uh, It's migraine without aura that occurs in a window that spans five days beginning two days before the onset of bleeding and lasting through the third day of flow. Research has shown that menstrual migraine tends to be more severe, longer lasting, more likely to be disabling, meaning missed work or missed appointments, than migraine brought on by other triggers. Migraine with aura 
uh, is a migraine that is accompanied by a, a complex neurologic phenomenon known as aura. Now, aura typically lasts uh, 5 to 20 minutes, but can last as long as 60. But it's not just a brief flash of light, or, and it's not a blurred vision. Um, just as migraine patients don't know that they have migraine, uh, many people who think that they have aura are describing symptoms that don't meet ICHD2 criteria for aura. Uh, the most common aura is visual. Uh, it, it's reflecting this underlying electrochemical wave that's moving forward across the occipital or visual cortex, and you can actually see it on a functional MRI. Um, the best known visual aura is the fortification spectrum, and that can begin as a small hole of light or bright geometrical lines that expand into a sickle or C-shaped object that has zigzag lines on the leading edge. Uh, auras can also include a partial loss of vision with bright shimmering borders, which is called a scintillating scotoma. But the second most common type of aura is sensory. Now, this is often seen in conjunction with visual aura. They may start visual and then move into the sensory one. But these are typically tingling and numbness in one hand that then spreads to the same elbow and then to the same side of the face and tongue. And it will also last about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, there's something called dysphasic aura, which causes just transient speech and language problems. But rarest of all is, is the motor aura, which is also called hemiplegic migraine, in which the patient experiences motor weakness. It's important to understand that most people with migraine never have aura. Only 15 to 25 percent will ever have one, and that might only be once in a lifetime or two or three times a year. It could be as often as uh, at once or more times a month. Uh, but most of my patients with aura also have common migraine or migraine without aura. But, and it's interesting, too. When they have both, they'll often refer only to the one with the aura as their migraine, missing the fact that all these others are migraines also. What causes migraine? Well, back when I was training, and we're going back to the 70s here, uh, we were taught that it was a vascular headache meaning that the pain part was caused by vascular dilation and the aura that preceded it or, or did not precede it either way was caused by vascular constriction. We now know that that's not right. Um, vasodilation may play a part in the throbbing head pain. It's even been shown that the throbbing is not uh, synchronous with heartbeat. But it is probably an, an epiphenomenon. It just results from the instability in the central uh, neurovascular control mechanism. But the mechanism of migraine appears to be pri primarily neuronal, not vascular. It's a dysfunction that leads to a sequence of changes that then would give you an imbalance between brain stem uh, pain regulation and vascular control, between excitation and inhibition, you might say. When the nerve fibers, and we're talking here primarily of the ophthalmic division, trigeminal nerve, uh, they line uh, about 80% of the blood vessels in the brain. Uh, but when the nerve fibers that line these dural blood vessels are activated, then you're releasing kinin, substance P, calcitonin gene-related peptides, a variety of other vasoactive polypeptides, all of which cause pain and vasodilation. They convert the brain to looking like something um, for all the world that would look like sterile encephalitis. We call it either neurogenic inflammation or inflammatory soup. I make it simpler when I talk to patients. Um, when they ask why they have migraine, I say that the only prerequisite for migraine is inheriting a threshold for setting off the trigeminal nerve that's too low. It should be way up there, but theirs is low enough that things such as estrogen falling before a period, a weather front moving through, somebody wearing the wrong perfume, not getting enough sleep, all can set it off and trigger a migraine. Their next door neighbor with a normal threshold never gets a headache from any of these migraine triggers. Do some women who report migraines have something else instead? Well, typically, uh, no. Typically, people who think that they have like tension headaches or sinus headaches or whatever actually have migraine. Several years ago, Roger Cady did a brilliant study. Uh, he advertised in the local paper, which was the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, for people who had sinus headaches to come into his office for a study. 
Well, what the people didn't know is that the study simply consisted of being interviewed by headache specialists. Uh, they would use formal diagnostic criteria to see what kind of headache the patient actually had. More than 90% of them had migraine. Now, tension-type headache is very common, but uh, what's not common with it is to seek medical attention for it. Uh, and, of course, in this country, we like to say that sinus headache is the street name for migraine. You can cure them by sending them to Europe where those words aren't even put together. I've heard that it was a, a, um, an advertising agency for the Dristan account that coined the term sinus headache. But the problem is, um, by ICHD2 criteria, tension headache is diagnosed by the opposite of the criteria used to diagnose migraine. It's the same four things, you know, the unilateral or bilateral, steady or throbbing, not worse with activity, worse with activity, mild to moderate in intensity versus moderate to severe. Well, tension type only has to meet two out of the four criteria of either bilateral, steady, not made worse with activity, or mild to moderate. The problem is obvious then, because if both migraine and tension type are being judged on the same set of four criteria, you can have only two of them and not know which one you have. Like, for, in, uh, for instance, if you have um, a headache that's steady and bilateral, that sounds like tension type, but it's moderate to severe and made worse by moving the head around, that's migraine, well, the tiebreaker comes down to the associated symptoms. Does the patient have nausea? Does she prefer prefer, not even, it's not that the headache gets worse with light or, or, move, or um, noise, but does she prefer to avoid bright lights and loud noises with the headaches? If yes, it's migraine. Now, the simple version of this is that migraine is a, an episodic disabling headache. It's very common in all cultures. In the U.S., 12 to 13 percent of Americans have migraine, and in midlife, say in the 30s or 40s, between a quarter and a third of women have migraine. What does the literature suggest about the baseline risk of stroke associated with migraine and migraine with aura? All in all, the stroke risk is roughly doubled in migraine, but most, if not all, of that increased risk you can attribute to the aura. Uh, migraine without aura patient probably has no higher stroke risk than her next door neighbor, but aura confers, confers the increased risk. And a couple of studies have suggested that the more frequent the aura, the greater the risk of stroke. What is the relationship between estrogen levels and migraine, including migraine with aura? Menstrual migraine uh, occurs in the majority of women with migraine. Uh, for them, a sufficient decline in estrogen can trigger a migraine. Now, this can occur either with a natural menstrual cycle or when they transition on to placebo pills and an oral contraceptive. And, and with them, the problem is not how high the estrogen goes, it's how far it drops. Uh, studies I did about 15 years ago showed that if I limited the drop in estrogen to the equivalent of 10 micrograms of EE, I prevented the migraine. And back then, that could not be done you know, with any of the o OCs that we currently had at that time. Um, so I had to sort of experimentally use uh, something that was similar to eliminating the two placebo pills in Merced. I used a 20 microgram pill and then had them transition onto 10 micrograms. Today, we can have a lot of, of commercially prepared products that will do this. Now, with migraine, with aura, um, the, the estrogen level uh, issue is more that the higher the concentration of estrogen, the greater the risk of aura. So if you put someone, say, on a 35 microgram birth control pill, the levels of estrogen that they're seeing for those three weeks on the 21-7 schedules are roughly equivalent to ovulatory levels. So that's the highest that you normally go with estrogen in a natural menstrual cycle. If they have aura there, which is where they're most likely to have it in the cycle, you're probably increasing the risk of aura by putting them on a pill that gives them 21 days at that level and not just one. So it can certainly be an issue uh, in triggering aura. What does the literature suggest about the risk of stroke associated with combination oral contraceptive use in women with migraine? And that, again, including migraine with aura. Well, the use of oral contraceptives has been controversial in the setting of migraine with, with aura uh, due to some international studies that showed a small but increased risk of stroke with your use. 
that the assumption was that if migraine with aura doubled the risk of stroke and oral contraceptives also increased the risk of stroke, well, putting the two together might present an unacceptable risk. A JAMA article, Journal of the American Medical Association, back in 1975 did show an increased risk of stroke with oral contraceptives. It was roughly four times higher, but interestingly, the risk was no greater in migraineurs than in non-migraineurs. They actually looked at who had migraine, and they were not statistically more likely to have a stroke on an oral contraceptive than women who did not have migraine. And furthermore, the authors could make no correlation between the estrogen dose and the stroke risk because 23 of the 25 women uh, were, who had the strokes were taking the 100 microgram mestrinol formulation and all 20 of the ones on the ethanol estradiol formulation were taking the 50 microgram dose. So they're all high dose pills. Uh, back in the 1970s, that's what we were dealing with. And more recent studies confirm still that 50 microgram pills present about a fourfold increased risk of stroke. That number hasn't changed. Now, 20 years later, the Titty in a New England Journal uh, article looked at 3.6 million women years of use of OCs and found first that stroke was quite rare in women on oral contraceptives. It was roughly 1 in 10,000 uh, women years of use or 10 in 100,000 women years of use. And current uh, use of an oral contraceptive did not increase the stroke risk. In fact, in that study, it was 0.96, slightly below uh, the predicted risk, but not increased for sure. But in that study, fewer than 1% were using a 50 microgram pill. That reflects today's use of OCs in, in this country. Now, the discrepancy between studies done in the U.S. and the international studies that have caused the alarm is probably best explained by the strong contraindication in the U.S. to using oral contraceptives in smokers over the age of 35. The majority of subjects in the, in the World Health Organization study were smokers, and the majority of strokes that occurred in that study were on 50 microgram pills. Now, a recent U.S. study, uh, a pooled analysis of two large case control studies, showed no increased risk of stroke on oral contraceptives. But in that study, fewer than 1% of users were on high-dose pills, and only 17% of these U.S. oral contraceptive users were smokers, again, reflecting how they're used in this country versus how they're used in other parts of the world. But now in 2006, ACOG recommended against combined hormonal contraceptives in women who have migraine with aura. Now, those statements were written before the introduction of 15 and even 10 microgram formulations. And in their own preamble to their, to their announcement, you know, their position paper, they acknowledged that some of these newer products um, might have a different risk. Nevertheless, they lumped them all together. I've actually showed in my research uh, that inhibition of ovulation with these ultra-low dose formulations decreased aura frequency in women with aura. Because with inhibiting ovulation at a lower level than your own natural cycle, you're exposing the woman to lower estrogen concentrations than they would otherwise have, which theoretically should not only reduce uh, aura, but reduce stroke risk. I think it's time for ACOG's recommendations to be reassessed, you know, given our current knowledge and current prescribing options. Could you briefly characterize the concerns that were described in the 2006 ACOG practice bulletin on contraception for women with medical conditions in regard to women with migraine? Sure. There were three concerns. The first was uh, they were concerned that all women with migraine are at increased risk of stroke uh, if they take oral contraceptives. Even though that 1975 JAMA article we talked about showed an increased risk of stroke with high-dose oral contraceptives, the risk in women with or without migraine was the same. In the World Health Organization study, the authors themselves reported that risk went up with aura, with frequency of aura, with number of years of migraine, but there was no separate risk attributable to migraine. That second concern was a pooled analysis of two U.S. studies, the one I just talked about, showed a, a statistically significant two-fold increased risk of ischemic stroke among current users of oral contraceptives who also had migraine compared to those using oral contraceptives who did not have migraine. Now, 
that study, first of all, as we just said, showed no increased risk of stroke with oral contraceptives. The twofold increased risk of stroke that they're talking about was based on only four cases. The actual raw prevalence of migraine was the same in cases and controls. It was four out of 51 cases, 14 out of 182 controls, exactly the same uh, uh, ratio. But the relative risk of two was attained only after adjustment for other factors in four cases. Now, the study's own authors in the discussion of their study urged caution in interpreting their data because, as they said, imprecise methods, which differed between the two study sites, were used to diagnose migraine. And their final statement was, no firm conclusions can be drawn. The third uh, concern was uh, a large Danish population-based study found that among women who had migraine, the risk of stroke was three times higher. Now, that study is interesting for another reason, too. Now, it showed that there was no increased risk of stroke with 20 microgram pills, but a fourfold increased risk with 50s, just as we've always known. Now, the threefold increased risk in migraine patients is suspect because only 6% of the controls were diagnosed as migraine patients in a population where 19% of women have migraine. Now, a very appropriate 17% of the cases were correctly identified as migraineurs. So it makes you wonder, did they selectively not allow migraine patients in the control group? But a very similar study in France done about the same time found an equal distribution of migraine with stroke and, and, and uh, cases and controls, and they had a much more believable prevalence of migraine in both cases and controls.